it gets here or what? I think that's right. Yeah. Okay. All right, we have two more that are walking in right now, so. We've been in the parking lot. How are you doing? Good, Good. to see you. Good to see you, too. Awesome. Yeah. Can I go that way? Yeah. All right, Jared's... Uh, Walking in anyway, I'll go ahead and call it to order and uh, we'll do a pledge. Uh, all right. So this is the February 8th policy board meeting of the Pensacola and Pretty Debate Estuary Program. It is 1.32. Uh, and, uh, and Woody, would you lead us in the, in the pledge? Let's do the roll call, please. All right, Chair Bender. Here. Vice Chair Speed. Here. Commissioner Wright. Here. Mayor Fitch. Here. Commissioner Smith. Here. Commissioner Kohler. Here. Mr. Compton. Here. Ms. Campbell. Here. Uh, Councilman Moore. He said he's walking in, so. All right. Uh, Mayor Boutwell. I think he was gonna be on the phone. And then uh, Mike Norberg is uh, out of time, out of town today, but we do have a quorum. Okay, perfect. Um, as we go to approval of the board agenda, I would just like to say I'm gonna probably move some of the action items around a little bit and um, move them up to the beginning of the meeting. So um, as Commissioner Smith here and, and um, just make sure we have a good dialogue and things like that, so. Um, well, that said, I'll take a motion on approval of the board agenda. Move to approve. Second. Uh, any in opposition? Passes unanimously. Uh, we'll do uh, approval of the policy board minutes from December 14th. Mr. Chairman, just a quick correction uh, on the minutes. Uh, thankfully pointed out by uh, Councilman Baer. Uh, it should just be noted that for the minutes, it was noted that uh, Councilman Moore was absent. He hadn't yet been confirmed by the city council at that point, so we'll just uh, strike that to show that that position was vacant at that time. Perfect. Anything else? I'll move for approval with, uh, as amended. Okay. Second. Second. Uh, any opposition? All right, the motion passes unanimously. Um, all right, well, I was going to move approval of legal counsel services up, um, but I guess she's not here. She can't make it, but um, I'll still just go ahead and take that one um, uh, first, which would be action item E. Um, is there any discussion or? Or Matt, do you want to recap it? So Sure. Yep, I'd be happy to. So. 
of, of course, as we've talked uh, the last few months as the board, and I know there's a number of new members as well, um, as we work towards our independent status, having our own uh, general counsel uh, will be very critical for us as we set up uh, our special district and transition our organizational structure. Uh, so one of the things, one of the first steps is to, is to bring on uh, those, those services. Uh, we reached out to several different firms with the available budget that was approved for this fiscal year. Um, and one of the ones that we reached out to with, was Mary Jane Bass at Beggs and Lane. Um, we had a conversation with her last week. She was uh, very supportive and wants to be engaged in this, has experience working uh, with other local governments, including City of Gulf Breeze, Santa, Santa Rosa Island Authority, and has experience with uh, special districts as well. Um, so in your backup includes the uh, agreement with Beggs and Lane uh, for a not to exceed a $10,000 uh, to assist us in this, in this transition and serve as our general counsel for the SDRA program. Okay, I don't, I don't think I've, I've seen that. Um, is it separate or? Because uh, it just has, I just have what it says on the screen that it would be added if it was received in time. Okay. Um, is that, I, can you get that for the uh, See, I've got a copy of the three page agreement if you want. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it should be in your backup. Question, if I may, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir, go ahead. Uh, uh, Mayor Fitch, is, is Mary Jane also the attorney for the city of Gulf Breeze? Yes. Okay. And you guys very have been very happy? Okay. Oh, yeah. And also the Santa Rosa Island Authority. So I know we've jointly been working on a case with her, um, with the Island Authority, um, and the her legal expertise and, and ability is is not in question on my end. So, um, okay. Uh, any further discussion? I would take a motion on approving uh, Beggs and Lane as the for legal services. Move to approve. Second. All right. Uh, any opposition? Motion passes unanimously. Um, so the next, I, I did want to take up this special district charter discussion, um, and I think part of that is is because I think uh, what I'm hearing from. Um, our, our council and, and Okaloosa's is that the way we were going about this, they maybe didn't agree with. Uh, so I was looking to, to hear uh, from staff and, and what we were trying to accomplish um, as it relates to our, our friends to the west. Um, and, um, and, and so I wanted to try to ad address that and, and get that settled uh, with, a, with a path forward um, before we, we moved on. So. Yep, absolutely. Thanks. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. So uh, as you'll recall, the, the December board meeting brought forward a, an amendment to our existing interlocal agreement, essentially to try to kill two birds with one stone. Uh, so that way we could set up the special district and make sure we maintain that continuity and relationship between the Florida and Alabama parties. At that point, uh, both the, the county attorney for Escambia and Okaloosa came back and said, that's not going to work. So that, that process of efficiency did not work out. Uh, What's before you is a proposed new charter to set up that special district. Um, that does include the Florida parties, but the, the kind of where the relationship comes in is making sure that there's a nexus to our existing interlocal agreement. Because my goal is to make sure that, um, again, the continuity of, of current operations and the board makeup remains the same and make sure that there's uh, the same um, uh, roles and responsibilities between the Florida jurisdictions as, as there is with the Alabama jurisdictions. Um, we have discussed this with, with Mary Jane. Um, I think she believes that there's a way to work through this. Uh, we talked last night about what potential language could look like. So she is coming up with you know, two or three different options as to how we can make, make that connection. Really all I'm asking today from the board is um, you know, just kind of bless this in concept to make to allow me to work with our new general counsel to come up with a language that is going to work uh, to reach that end goal, and then to work respectively with with your county and city attorneys to get there. Um, made this made the statement. I'm not an attorney, so we've got to bring in you know the experts to make this work. The one thing I will say is that we've been able to to do this for the last five years without any issue. There is there should be a path forward here. 
And, yeah. uh, and Matt, I would agree with you, and, and I guess that's where I had gotten confused and didn't understand maybe what, what uh, Okaloosa was saying and even what Escambia County was saying. Uh, uh, for the board, I would say they felt that we were doing a, a workaround um, and, and questioned that to uh, create this special entity in Florida and then immediately um, sign up with, with Alabama. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we look at our TPO, uh, that is a federal level, um, and that's why we could go beyond, um, but, um, I mean, we're doing it, we've been doing it right now. So, um, and, um, you know, so I, I, I would like to hear from, from Mary Jane and, and see how, what her suggestions are. Uh, of course, I don't want to, to do anything that would, uh, um, that our county attorneys would, would seem to be were outside the law or, or uh, not in the, the um, under the guidance of the state attorney's uh, opinion. Um, but on the same time, I want to include you guys. And so um, that's, uh, it was important to me to sort of kind of have that discussion. Um, I would say one other thing that I, I did mention to Matt and I'll look for, for y'all's direction um, is that it says that we can allow other governmental entities regulatory agencies or other entities uh, to the extent allowed by law to participate as members of the policy board, provided they are a unanimous approval. Uh, I would have been willing to make that a super majority of seven votes um, if, if that was uh, the will of the board. Uh, if not, I'm happy either way, but I just, I thought a super majority would, would be a a good way, but I was told to include the specific number so that way if you barely make quorum, it's not the super majority of just who's present. I would certainly support that. Okay. Yeah, no problem here. Yeah, I agree. Okay. Um, I, I guess yeah. then, so other than with that one change, you just want us to approve it conceptually with, with staff direction to work with our new county, or our new uh, representation and uh, come forward with an agreement that that suits all of uh, all of the current parties yes sir that that would be great my objective here is to make sure I don't get sideways with any one jurisdiction or any of y'all so this just gives me the path forward to work with our attorney uh, and y'all's respective attorneys to to land whatever that looks like but ultimately having that same goal of continuing the continuity of this board and, and where we move forward uh, do you need, I mean, is that necessary to take action just to staff direction there? If, if it's staff direction and, and I've got consensus from y'all, that works for me. So how quickly do you think we can, we could get this in front of everybody? And I mean, um, I know we're going to do our meeting schedule here um, in a minute, but um, is it something that we would want to hold a special meeting on before April 5th? We. That is certainly possible. Um, let me get with Mary Jane after this. I think we'll, we'll probably be able to come to some sort of resolution just internally in the next couple of days and then start that communication with each of your jurisdictions here, you know, next week or so. Um, so it, it would probably be prudent if possible that we have a special meeting, but I'll, I'll follow up with uh, the board after uh, Mary, Jane, Mary Jane and I talk uh, later today or tomorrow. Okay, is that good for the rest of the board? Yes, I'm good. Yes, ma'am. Hello. Oh, there we go. About the the voting, I know this district. Th we're not going. This won't be for Baldwin County, right? The special district. We won't be signing this one, will we? Under the current structure, structure and it's okay. and it's and it's the, the amendment to the existing our okay. our local agreement. The wording under D voting, it just says voting will be co conducted in person to the maximum extent possible. And I know you and I had that discussion because sometimes it's it's a, a drive to the, the location. So does that mean that there's a option of voting um, online and, uh, or not? Right, so my understanding is there's Florida statute that, um, that prohibits being able to vote remotely, but I do know that our sister program in Indian River Lagoon is working on some legislation because they have such a wide territory to be able to allow for that remote participation. So we'll definitely confer with them, but for right now, it is a, a Florida. And I would, I would say, I, I believe Florida Association of Counties is also working on it uh, along the lines of, um, you, you can't be the one to make quorum, um, but otherwise uh, should be able to participate, but that would that would take some action from the legislature to, to allow that. Uh, sometimes it's, it's in, in, in 
um, unusual circumstances or extenuating circumstances. Um, and then I guess it also depends on if the, the governor uh, does any, anything to change that like he did during COVID. So, um, but I, I think uh, for right now, our, our understanding is, is that we would have to be present voting members, but you'd still be able to participate. Correct, correct. And I had one more, you know, our attorney had recommended under 6-8, um, instead of having um, the documents recorded in each uh, county where the, the parties are located, that it, it could be rewritten to where it's just recorded once with you. Uh, was that a problem? Um, that was just one of our attorney's recommendations. I, I don't think that should be a problem, but we'll go back uh, to Mary Jane and, and, and see if that's gonna be an issue. Um, I would think that that's standard boilerplate language that could probably change without too much of an issue. Just, we wouldn't all have to record it in sure. our area. So. Sure, absolutely. I do think Grover wanted to make a comment, if that's, if that's all sure. right. Sure, so uh, for, I know we all got the email that we have a new employee. <laughs> uh, so Grover, Grover's uh, uh, gonna come on board for a couple months as we work towards the uh, getting this independent status and uh, also, I think, try to work on some additional funding uh, avenues for us. And uh, so, uh, I, I mean, uh, are you Mr. Commissioner Mayor? Or, uh, <laughs> I, I, I am. I think I think I'm a Scamby County intern number seven. Okay, so perfect. I'm 007 intern, I believe, is, is what. Uh, but uh, but I'm happy uh, to be here with the uh, estuary plan and certainly uh, appreciate the opportunity. Uh, uh, Scambia County is very interested in seeing this get independent, and so uh, that's sort of why I'm here. I tell people that uh, I'm here because Matt's got to fly the plane while we're building the plane. It's my job to build the plane. That means there is an, a beginning and an end. Matt will continue to fly the plane, and he's doing the flying. I'm simply helping him build, finish building out the plane. I think the big part also that gets a little bit tripped up is every other estuary plan. There are there are estuary programs that extend uh, that go both states uh, they were all set up by federal jurisdiction first uh, we're doing this backwards uh, in many ways but uh, we think it's worth doing and we're going to continue to do it. You'll probably see in your backup, you also see number F, uh, which also talks about us uh, going forward with a federal uh, request. Uh, the city of Pensacola is already taking this up as well tomorrow night. And I appreciate uh, Councilman Moore uh, getting this on their agenda and, and they will be doing this. Uh, we really need each one of you, uh, if we're successful passing this today, uh, to also go forward and ask your individual jurisdictions uh, because this is also uh, one of the ways we, we are two pronged. We are going through the state, but we are also looking for that federal designation uh, in both those things. And we realize we've been very clear with EPA that this is uh, th th this is sort of unprecedented. We're out there in uncharted waters, and I think this is one of the reasons. I uh, certainly appreciate Escambia County helping me. Uh, get here to help um, Matt because we are in this sort of unprecedented waters. We definitely expect to be and, and expect to be a two state program. Uh, we very much, um, I think I was talking with uh, uh, Councilman Speed and, and before we, we got we got up here that, that it's our, our intention uh, to go to Montgomery just like we go to Tallahassee. So we are very much planning to be a two state uh, entity. Uh, we, we realize this is a little bit tricky and so we are trying to figure out how to do this with, with, with the rules that are allowable. So um, that's why it was good to have a good, first thing I did coming in was making sure we get the, the attorney. We've got that hopefully moving forward. So now uh, it's our process both to follow the state process but also the federal side as well. So um, when we get to that point, we're gonna need, hopefully we pass it as a body here, but then we need each of you to go back to your individual jurisdictions and take the same language and get on your agendas to approve this. Uh, we, we, we think that will be uh, very helpful for us both, both moving the process forward, but also at the federal level saying we have nine jurisdictions uh, all <laughs> interested in working to make this happen. And, and I, would, I would concur that I think it's you're right in today's day and age after COVID, we, we ought to learn how to do electronic part, but unfortunately sometimes Florida law is not caught up with that. So I know um, that effort is, is happening. And if we can make that happen in Florida law, I, th I hope one day that, that, that works and we're able to do more of that uh, so that it's easier for everybody to participate. 
Uh, and Matt, I guess while we're on that real quick, do you just want to give a brief update as to uh, Senator Rubio's actions last week? Yep. Yep. So these are all things I was going to cover under under staff updates. So yes, we are happy to have uh, Grover on board assisting us in, in that transition and in national designation. I, I still struggle to just call him Grover and not mayor or, or commissioner. But um, yes, we, we did have some exciting news within the last uh, couple weeks. Uh, as you'll remember, uh, back in 2021, Senator Rubio filed legislation for us to be designated as uh, a national estuary program and uh, to designate Pensacola and Prito Bays as estuaries of national significance uh, with the sun setting of, of uh, the 117th Congress and, and the new 118th uh, Congress coming in at, at the start of January. Uh, Senator Rubio did reintroduce that legislation uh, and that was included as one of nine bills on his pro-Florida agenda. And so we're very grateful to, to his office. We're in contact with his office about opportunities that we have uh, to advance that legislation. Uh, of course, the, the opportunities for uh, including both Florida and Alabama uh, co-sponsorship is, is um, uh, you know, very much something that we're, we're seeking. Um, but additionally, you know, we are going, uh, and, and we'll see in this backup uh, for number uh, F or 7F, um, going the, the governor's nomination route, which is uh, the formal route that's dictated in the Clean Water Act. Um, so as, as Grover mentioned, we'll be sending out this, res this uh, template resolution letter to each of y'all to get on your respective commission and councils. Um, and uh, just tomorrow, I'll be going over uh, to meet with Secretary Hamilton from, from DEP uh, to work on uh, Governor DeSantis' uh, endorsement for, for that designation. Great. And, I'll, and I will see, uh, I'll at least be in Senator Rubio's office next week and um, his staff is still trying to figure out his time schedule, but hope to get in front of him and, and continue to push this along with some of our other uh, delegation members uh, up in D.C. Um, all right, well, why don't we go ahead and just take F then, seeing we're already practically on it. Um, so this is approval of resolution 2301 requesting designation of Pensacola Purdue Bay Estuary Program as National Estuary Program. Second. Okay. Uh, any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Okay. Uh, so, yes. If we could, we will get that out to all of you individually. I believe Escambia County is set for this to come next week. I believe so, you. yes, sir. And again, Pensacola is going to take it up uh, tomorrow night, but we will get it out to everybody else. If you could help us get it on your agenda between now and in and, and March, that would be good. Yeah. Okay. Sure, we'll make sure Senator County has on uh, the week after next. Okay. Perfect. Um, okay. So, uh, Part of the reason why I skipped A, though, was because I wanted to make sure that, that we were good to have uh, our friends to the West uh, still a part of us and, and included um, as, as we elect the next uh, board chair. Um, uh, I, I would say I, I wholeheartedly uh, support Woody uh, becoming the next chair. Um, I just didn't want it to get into a, a, a pickle of uh, you being the chair and, and then not being in it anymore. So. Um, uh, uh, so with that, I'll, I would open the floor to, to nominations, and you can self-nominate if, you, if you'd like. Or um, I'd, I'd nominate Woody as chair. Okay. Yeah. Second. Uh, any other nominations? Okay. Uh, it's close. So I'll go ahead and, and take a, uh, a vote for uh, Woody to become the chair. Uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Pass it unanimously. Congratulations. Um, or condolences. <laughs> you know. yeah. um, and then uh, we're looking for, for vice chair. Um, and uh, I know historically we've uh, rotated a little bit between Escambia and Santa Rosa County, so I, I was going to nominate uh, Colton uh, to be vice chair. I'll second that. Okay. Is there anybody else that would like to? Okay. Uh, all in favor of uh, Commissioner Colton Wright being vice chair, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Passes unanimously. Congratulations. Um, and then uh, we'll go ahead and do the approval of the 2023 uh, meeting schedule. Uh, thank you. Second. Um, I would say these dates did look a little bit better than the <laughs> than when it was presented last time. So. Um, 
Yes, sir. We, we, we did try to accommodate as, as many board meetings, uh, board member schedules as possible. I think there's still a few conflicts out there towards the latter half, uh, but at least the next couple months look clear. So okay. uh, just, just if there's issues that arise, please just let me or staff know. Perfect. Uh, so we, we already moved that, right? Mm -hmm. All right. Any opposition? Uh, passes unanimously. And then our uh, finance strategy. Yes, sir. So this was an item that was tabled from uh, the December meeting. Uh, I've met with, with many of the board members um, or discussed this with you over the phone. Uh, just a couple of uh, changes to note uh, really relate under the personnel section of the finance strategy. Um, included in there within is a table that explains uh, kind of my thought process on how those positions will be funded over uh, the next five year period, whether that's general fund and when I say general fund, <laughs> That means local, state, and federal contributions that are coming into the program versus grants that we're receiving. And so you'll see that most of the, any of the new positions that we're, that we're considering or talking about in this plan are either currently grant-funded positions or we, that we assume to be grant-funded positions here soon enough. Um, and then there's uh, two positions related to a finance manager position and, and development coordinator that would be general-funded um, when that time comes. And the, the major thing I wanna point out is that um, you know, this is a non-binding strategy. What this does, it gives me a roadmap as we move forward and, and uh, uh, makes it clear, I think, between the board and me as, as to how we move forward. But certainly if there's any new positions that are created or contributions, et cetera, that's discussed annually and, and comes to the board for approval uh, during the, during the um, annual budget development process. Thank you. Uh, so I agree. I, I think the laying it out between grant and general funded um, helps a lot. Uh, and also that this is just a strategy and not necessarily a uh, 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 approval of these positions. They would still have to come back, still be put in the budget, things like that. So um, uh, anyway, I'd open up to, to comments. Anybody have any comments? Well, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Uh, I, I appreciate your hard work on this. I, I think this uh, it's a little more, I don't want to say transparent, because not that the other one wasn't transparent, but it's easier to understand. Uh, I concur on, on having... Uh, grant versus, you know, general uh, separate out makes it a lot easier. And I think this is definitely a step in the right direction, so I would certainly support it. It gives us a roadmap for the future. And, and, that's, and that's good, uh, and I think that's, that's what we need uh, as we continue to, to show that we want to grow and, and what our next steps are. But, uh, again, it's non-binding. Uh, it's a strategy, and it would still take further action from this board to, to have those positions come on. So uh, any other discussion? I had a question about the operating budget projections with the, um, you just have a couple on, under equipment, you start out high and then it re reduces and then on contractual services, it, you know, it's uh, platforms and then it goes up to 75,000. Is that, you, you're already, you know, right. what that's, what, what is that about? Right, so that, that's a great question. I'm glad you brought that up. So you'll see the, the equipment budget increases for purchase of either a vehicle or a vessel. I think we're working something out through Orange Beach for hopefully a, a donation of a, of a vehicle. Um, but then, you know, over time as, as we grow, uh, having a vessel um, uh, to support the program operations will, will be key. Um, and then on the contractual side, that is looking forward as we start the amendment process to our CCMP already in, in, in five years from now. That's hard to believe. <laughs> <laughs> and again, same with the personnel all those purchases, equipment, things like that would still have to come in front of, uh, in front of the board. So uh, anything else? All right, I'll take a motion then to approve the finance strategy. Move to approve. Second. Okay. Uh, any opposition? Motion passes unanimously. All right. What, uh, you want to do staff updates or you want to do our presentation? We'll go, go ahead and do the, the guest presentation if that's all right with the board. Um, Today we have uh, two guests uh, from the University of Florida, Dr. Christine Angelini and, and Colin Ordles, uh, coming in from uh, Gainesville. Uh, I think some of the board members are aware, we've, we've talked about this uh, the last six months or so, uh, a project update and partnership that we have with the University of Florida that is really made possible by Senator Broxson uh, this, this past, uh, past session. Uh, I think as many of our, our Florida uh, parties and, and friends know that he has made water quality a priority of his. Um, as he's the appropriations chair and, and as he has his last two years uh, in the state senate and really wanted to try to advance um, the opportunities that our region has for uh, water quality improvement, 
coastal resiliency and habitat restoration uh, in our area. And so this project is a great partnership with, uh, with UF on uh, how we can work together to advance some of those regional priorities. And so Christine is gonna take it from there and, and give us an update. All right, thanks a lot, Matt. Um, thank you all for your time and attention. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, as Matt said, I'm from the University of Florida. I'm director of a new program there called the Center for Coastal Solutions. And um, we've been warmly welcomed into this community and are really sort of building, hopefully, what will be lifetime friendships and also a long-term collaboration with this area. Um, so it's my job today to give you an overview of this project um, that, um, as uh, Matt shared, um, has been really quarterbacked by Senator Broxson um, to help the region tackle its water quality challenges. All right, please go ahead. So there's a variety of partners that are engaged in this project, and I want to share that the pro work that I'm going to be presenting is really a consortium of the efforts of folks from the private industry, um, as well as um, you know multiple uh, entities from the University of Florida, including uh, colleagues from locally here at the Milton campus of UF IFAS. Um, but also participation from Florida Sea Grant, Bream Fishermen's Association, Choctatchee Basin Alliance. So this is very much um, an interdisciplinary and multi-sector collaboration um, with the work that you're seeing presented here today. Okay, go ahead. So really let's talk about kind of what the big picture vision of this project is and what the ultimate objective is. Please go ahead. Um, so what we're here to do and what we were charged with delivering in this project is to develop an infrastructure improvement strategy for this region that is um, associated with an actionable funding roadmap. So how do we get those projects actually implemented and, um, and, and resourced that will collectively improve water quality across this broader Western Florida Panhandle region? Please go ahead. So this infrastructure improvement strategy is an inclusive of both green and gray infrastructure solutions, and I'll tell you a little bit more about what I mean by that in the future. Uh, please go ahead. It's both data-driven. This is ultimately sort of a science-based approach to how do we improve water quality and the move the needle on that, but also stakeholder-informed and guided, and we're really engaging with local partners here um, to make sure that we're um, putting forth a strategy that's, that's guided by what stakeholders can do and want to do. Um, and please go ahead. And really sort of what we're here to deliver in terms of this project to, team is to support this broader region in bringing in dollars <laughs> into this region to support infrastructure improvements and really teeing up um, both the um, efficient and coordinated development and submission of proposals that bring those resources here to this region. Please go ahead. So let's talk a little bit about the why. Um, I'm sure you all see in the news on a fairly regular basis that there is a consortium of water quality challenges that are faced in this region. Um, these are kind of coming up regularly um, all across the region with issues associated with sedimentation, bacteria, and nutrient pollution. And if you go ahead, um, and you can click one more time. Um, and there's a variety of designated impairments um, across this region as well. So we have it kind of cropping up in the local news, but also well documented by the Florida Department of Environmental Protection that this is a region that's a, facing a consortium of water quality challenges. Um, and so there's a, there's a need to develop a strategy to address these. Um, please go ahead. So what is this project going to be um, pulling together to develop a kind of integrated strategy as I shared? So the first thing that we're working on is diagnosing where we have water quality issues in this region using both existing and some new data analysis that are being put forward by this project team. Please go ahead. We're then using a modeling approach as well as some of those underlying data to identify what are the root sources of those water quality issues. We have to understand what the cause is, not just that we have a problem, but what is causing it. Please go ahead. We're also evaluating potential infrastructure investments. So what can we do now that we understand the root sources of these water quality challenges to address them? And we're taking an AI sort of driven um, approach to both identify and estimate the return on investment of different green and gray infrastructure solutions. Please go ahead. And then what we can do is pair those highest priority infrastructure projects with funding opportunities. And please go ahead and finally work with the local county to develop and submit pro these proposals that are being championed by our local partners, but ultimately supported by the underlying analysis and modeling that will be delivered by our project team. 
So a couple of final points, so please go ahead, is that um, our project team over the last year, the work started on July 1st of 2023, or sorry, 2022, is that we're standing up all of these components simultaneously. Um, so we're trying to take action e e efficiently um, in this project. Um, and there's some companion economic analysis work that's going on in this project that I'm, I'm not gonna talk about in the rest of my presentation, but if you have interest, I'd be happy to share, share those details. Um, please go ahead. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the geographic scope of this project. Um, we were given direction really to work on Escambia, Santa Rosa, and Okaloosa counties, as well as the watersheds that are draining into this region. Um, purpose being is that we need to think big and comprehensively about these water quality challenges. Local actions are not gonna achieve the downstream benefits that we're all sort of seeking. So a couple of benefits of taking this kind of big um, scale perspective of this approach are, um, and please go ahead, are that we can advance our sort of holistic scientific understanding of the contributors of these water quality challenges from the headwaters of these watershed all the way down to the ocean, as well as identify infrastructure so solutions at this big scale, okay? Um, please go ahead. It allows us to formulate a region-wide infrastructure improvement strategy. Um, and I think this is particularly relevant for all of you in that um, proposals that may be coming out for stormwater improvement projects or land conservation from your county can lean back and leverage its integration with this broader strategy to justify and motivate sort of um, the need for such a project to take place. Uh, please go ahead. Um, and what we can do by sort of delivering science and analysis and modeling at this scale is we can support some efficient assembly and submission of proposals that have sort of are backed by best available science and do that kind of, again, achieving a, an efficiency of scale. Please go ahead. So just a little bit about the technical details of what we're accomplishing for this region. Um, we are uh, working aggressively on cleaning and um, the data that's available from this region related to water quality um, and identifying where we have some gaps in data collection. Um, what we're able to do with the available data that we have is deliver at kind of a, a regional level um, a trend analysis of what is happening with regards to different um, uh, aspects of water quality. So so nutrient pollution versus bacterial dynamics. And from these trend analysis, please click ahead twice, um, is that we can both look at kind of the system behavior. So how flashy is this system depending on how much rainfall that we have or when we have different sort of climate forcings or when we've seen a big expansion of land use change, for instance, in the region. But we can also look at water quality trends um, in this area. Where are we seeing nitrogen pollution generally increasing or stable in different parts of this region, and what does that trend look like over sort of a longer time period of, say, the last 10 years versus the last five years? Where do we have kind of different time scales of change? And finally, we can identify when and where these water quality dynamics are exceeding numeric nutrient criteria and other thresholds that are relevant to sort of the ecological health and public health of the system. So if you go ahead, we can, for instance, take a look at, you know, in a given watershed, where does, um, where are the nitrogen levels consistently exceeding what would be deemed um, appropriate for this, for this area. And again, doing this in a consistent way across the entire region so that we can compare really how bad is the water quality, for, for instance, in Escambia County relative to Okaloosa County and thinking big about water quality dynamics. All right, please go ahead. Um, and again, please. So with regards to identifying kind of the root sources of these water quality challenges, we're working very hard on developing and what's called validating a SWOT model for this region, which is allows us to estimate the delivery of pollutants from different parts of the watershed. So in a sense, how much and where are pollutants coming from that ultimately end up downstream and in our coastal waters? Please go ahead. So the data that we're pulling together to sort of support this model are um, related to the landscape characteristics. So what's the land cover, what's sitting on the landscape, if you will, characteristics of the soil that affect how water and pollutants move through the landscape, as well as things like the slope. Um, so all of this goes into calibrating this model, and we're using model uh, water sampling measurements that have been um, collected by the Department of Environmental Protection, its equivalent in Alabama, and other local groups to essentially validate whether um, our model is performing well. 
And, if, and so on the map that you see on this picture, you can see a land use or a land cover map that shows you where we have kind of green space or more developed lands or agricultural lands, as well as the sampling locations of um, uh, where water quality samples have been taken. And in this particular picture, you can see, you know, what's the average in nitrogen loading that we're seeing over this time period with the color bars indicating, you know, as you go redder, those are locations where the nitrogen values are relatively higher over time. So this is what goes into this models. Um, and if you go forward to the next um, page, this is an example of the type of bottle output that we will be able to develop through this project. Um, and so in this model sort of output, and this is just an example, so don't interpret this or plan to overinterpret the red areas or the green areas too much, I'm just giving you a flavor for what you're gonna see, is that we can identify the sub portions of the watershed or the sub basins that are contributing relatively more to say nitrogen pollution or bacterial levels that are uh, um, sort of seeping downstream. This is really, really important for the region to be able to identify what are the highest priority locations for identifying where different infrastructure investments need to be taken to ultimately achieve downstream benefits. And so we're looking to deliver our sort of summary of our analysis results and our model modeling by the end of this fiscal year or this, yeah, um, by around July 1st. If you go forward. So let me tell you a little bit about how we're probing infrastructure solutions. So what do we do about water quality challenges here? Big picture steps is that we're doing a big survey of what is the current and planned infrastructure that's ongoing in this region. And I'll, I'll tell you in a minute what kind of infrastructure we're talking about. Um, we then take a look at where that infrastructure or, or lack of infrastructure is overlapping with our water quality hotspots and the sources. Um, we're moving forward to assess what's the potential cost, feasibility, fundability, and likelihood of reducing nutrient and, and bacterial pollution derived from given projects. And then we can basically prioritize for you projects that achieve particularly high returns on investment that essentially reduce a lot of nutrients given the sort of their, their potential cost. And this is what we're gonna be summarizing into this region-wide infrastructure improvement strategy. Okay, so if we move forward to the next, um, so the infrastructure types that we're considering at this point of time in our project are opportunities to conserve land and um, implement agricultural easements that can achieve water quality benefits. So where can we essentially take land out of potential development as a part of our broader water quality improvement strategy, as well as in the coastal areas, where might we expand the spatial extent um, in implementation of living shorelines that again would achieve water quality benefits. Please move ahead. Um, we're working on kind of a mixed infrastructure type, which is stormwater upgrades. Um, where do we need enhanced stormwater capacity in this region? And um, please go ahead. And finally, some gray infrastructure improvements. So where do we have opportunities for septic to sewer conversion, as well as upgrading aging infrastructure or sewer infrastructure in this area? So that's the big picture view of kind of the, the lens through which we're looking at infrastructure upgrades in the approach. And I just have a few more slides to give you an overview of kind of how we're actually prioritizing these infrastructure projects. So as an example, this is um, our stormwater work. This is being led by my colleague, Matt Deach, uh, who's here at the UF IFAS Milton campus. Um, so it's, it's well established that insufficient stormwater treatment um, can result in elevated nutrient loads and downstream receiving waters, um, enhanced erosion and downstream sedimentation. Um, it can be associated with essentially a destabilization, destabilization of development and can even contribute to downstream flooding. Okay, so there's a whole consortium of challenges if we don't have sufficient stormwater management. Please go ahead. There's a variety of different treatment methods that we can apply, that we have access to, to implement to address this challenge. These are a few of them listed here, and you see them kind of every time you go to Chick-fil-A. <laughs> There's a little stormwater uh, detention pond uh, right there to capture this stormwater. Um, please go ahead. So what, are, what we're doing in this project, again, at this broader region-wide scale, is to identify where do we have these major stormwater sources. So this is quantifying the area, basically where we have significant residential uh, development, commercial areas, industrial areas, major roads, essentially all of the impervious surfaces. 
And if you go ahead, this is a big sort of big picture snapshot of um, across this region, what is, where do we have the highest cover of impervious surfaces? It's, I'm sure it's not surprising to all of you that it's largely in our highly developed coastal areas here. These are the areas we're more likely to have stormwater issues, right, is where we have a lot of impervious surfaces. And if you go ahead, um, we're in the process right now then of identifying, mapping, and quantifying the existing treatment that we have on the landscape. So what do we already have here? These are kind of current um, availability of stormwater management. And if you go ahead, um, and then the steps that are coming, that are forthcoming in this project is to characterize, given the amount of stormwater that we have in given areas, what's the treatment volume that's needed to be sufficiently treat that, and where do we have basically this mismatch between loading and treatment to uh, deliver to all of you? These are the highest priority locations for stormwater treatment projects. And again, at this, at a standardized way at this regional scale. All right, please go ahead. Um, we're working on a sort of a similar or parallel approach to identifying opportunities for septic to sewer conversion in this region. And we're essentially looking at all potential combinations across the entire region using AI to do this of how can we link up our septic tanks to the sewer existing sewer systems we have in this region and how can we achieve the greatest cost efficiency of pulling on um, basically septic tanks onto the existing sewer network that achieves particularly high nutrient reduction loads where we have water quality issues. And if you go ahead, um, and please, I sort of shared that already, click forward two more times, that would be great, and one more. And really what we're gonna be able to deliver to you is a series of basically uh, potential projects, septic to sewer projects, that are based on this kind of region-wide analysis that will be delivered in a way that the information that we summarize can be directly implemented into proposals for funding, okay? All right, please go ahead. On the funding side, we're assembling a database of all the potential funding opportunities for these different infrastructure improvement projects that has a variety of different information in it that allows us to tie together the infrastructure projects that we've identified with appropriate sources of funding. And we're very soon gonna be applying these criteria associated with different funding opportunities to these different infrastructure types to say, for these septic to sewer projects, for instance, in this region, these are the highest uh, likelihood opportunities for funding to go get those projects sponsored. Um, and this includes an integration with the existing restore funding opportunities that um, are obviously very important to the region. Okay. So just what's ahead with this project, um, we've got another five months before our current funding runs out. So we're gonna be further advancing the analysis and deep dive into stakeholder engagement. Our meetings today have been focused on that and will continue to be over the next couple of months is how do we translate the science and the analysis we're doing to make sure stakeholders are willing, eager to use it and get their input on how to further imp basically improve it to meet their needs. Um, but also to start the process of developing and submitting proposals um, and contingent upon continued funding um, in the next, into the next fiscal year is actually to translate the findings that we have into this region-wide um, water quality improvement strategy and really help the region put its like foot on the gas with regards to proposal drafting and submission um, and we'll trick out the science, if you will, a little bit more over the next couple of years and continue to deliver some outcomes related to that. So that's what I have for, for as an overview of this project, and um, it's gonna require, I think, an all hands on deck approach uh, for sort of envisioning this strategy, but also implementing it as we move forward, and um, our partners for at PBEP are essential um, for essentially liaising to the community, but also um, really helping us get this work off the ground, so very much a partnership. All right, thank you. Um, and if I may just, so what was the timeline? I mean, I, I love the the deliverables on the septic to sewer and, and the mapping and stuff. Um, so when when is that expected? And I've, if it's right in front of me and I just don't understand that. So but. we would have, I think, related to um, each one of those infrastructure types, some initial results to share with all of you. We have outcomes from, say, the land conservation tool already that we could share with you of here's where we see the greatest, some really promising opportunities for conserving land that would achieve water quality benefits. On the septic to sewer, I think we're probably another six to 10 weeks out in terms of having oh. something that we feel like we have something really robust to sort of share with you as a starting point for conversation. Um, and uh, 
yeah, anyways, so uh, certainly by the end of June of this fiscal year, we hope to have some really, you know, essentially strong first starts with regards to results that you could take and run with, with the understanding that the sophistication of the science behind those will continue to evolve over time. But we're really eager to formalize this, like I said, into a strategy that this region can, you know, all leverage again to kind of move in a shared direction. Yeah, and especially with those funding opportunities, it's it's likelihood that those continue to evolve or, you yes. know, windows closes. So uh, and we need to those. stay very close to those that have the opportunity to go after them. And again, our our approach is to work with our local entities that are going to be the applicants here, but just to tee up the re, you know the justification they need for given projects you know, um, pre-populate, say, some of those proposals that reduces the barrier for submission and also kind of, I guess, if you will, opens up the, the opportunities to bring resources in here to really do these, do these projects. Perfect. Yep. And I think, Matt, yeah, I'm happy yeah. if you have anything to add, because... Yeah. Uh, yeah, just just a, a few brief comments. I just wanted to say to the board, this has been a, a tremendous partnership uh, with Christine and her team. Of course, when you start out projects like this, you don't necessarily know what what end result looks like, but that has become very clear as we've developed and worked together over the last six months. So our team at the SJ program has been working very closely with Christine and colleagues from UF. And it, as, as kind of Christine just um, wrapped up here, this is something that's not intended to be done in a vacuum, but to engage your respective staffs um, in this process to make sure that we can build on the work that's already being done. You, you all have great teams and staff mm -hmm. um, and there's unprecedented funding opportunities to go after. So it's really trying to provide the tools and, and the capacity that's necessary to go after those, those opportunities. I think we just saw in the last couple of days, Governor DeSantis announced the Resilient Florida grant list, $275 million. There are, there are three, three projects for, for our, our region, Northwest Florida, but I would hope through this work and, and others, we'd be able to see that number grow you know, tremendously in terms of what's able to come uh, you know, to, to Northwest Florida, but then of course to, to South Alabama as well. Um, so just wanted to highlight that point. If, if you haven't heard from, from us yet, our staffs, um, that's something that we'll be continuing the outreach um, in the coming weeks and months uh, to make sure that it also aligns with the existing priorities of your respective agencies. So many of y'all have a capital improvement um, program or, or, or plan, and we want to make sure these two efforts dovetails uh, so that way it really is that best bang for the buck and most um, achievable opportunity for water quality improvement as well. Perfect. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Um, Matt, I'm sure you're very familiar with all the hard work that Nazi Dollar has been doing on, on mapping out, you know, the, the um, the opportunities we have in Santa Rosa County for septic to sewer and, and just maybe to update everybody here on the board and the public, um, you know, we're also working on the land, land conservation and agriculture easements you mentioned. We're exploring that particularly in our, in our rural parts of Santa Rosa County where we've got prime farmland that we know we need to protect, uh, but also how to guide the proper development in the right areas. But I'll just give you guys a, qu a quick brief. Um, Things will be formal tomorrow because it's currently on our consent agenda for tomorrow's Board of County Commissioner meeting. Uh, but I expect it to be approved uh, for four positions for site inspection and environmental code enforcement officer. So uh, I think that dovetails into what we're trying to accomplish here to, to prevent the sediment loading into our local waterways. And we uh, also recently contracted with engineering firms to assist with sediment uh, reduction projects uh, up in the, the Allentown area. So, I, you know, and I know Eskimi County is doing the same type of thing. And I just encourage, you know, everyone to continue to internally within your own government agencies to keep doing that same type of projects and then dovetail in with you guys. So, so when the funding sure. comes out, you guys can help us, you know, carry, carry that big stick and help us get some money. Sure. I, well, and you. we look forward to that. And I, I think the broader awareness that we have about the work that's already underway, the efforts that are already there, um, it, it, uh, we want to be, again, in line with where momentum is already sort of, you know, being achieved and where a lot of, there's a lot of public interest and engagement as well and be very conscientious of that. And so oftentimes the public doesn't know. Yes. So I, I think that it's, it's good for us to kind of get out and, and talk about it a little bit so the public's more aware of what's really being happening, what's happening behind the scenes. Sure. So. And, and I was just, you know, I know for, for me, I, there are a couple of properties along Carpenter Creek that I've been, uh, had my eye on that either they're, too expensive or need to work a little bit with the owner to to uh, come off the price or or there's another one that that we don't want to sell right now you know and um so I, I think again those opportunities to continue to to conserve that land um in those areas 
um, is definitely something I'm working on. So, uh, any other comments? Yeah. Great, thank you so much for your presentation. Appreciate it, and look forward to the to the finished product. All right, with that, thank you, Christine. Uh, with that, we'll go into staff updates. We covered a number of the ones I was going to cover already: uh, review of reauthorization, uh, Grover coming on board. Um, uh, since the last meeting, we did receive a EPA grant extension for uh, our main restore grant that will officially close out in April now. Uh, that allows us uh, sufficient time to close out the remaining um, uh, finance strategy, monitoring strategy, uh, et cetera, and allow our contracts to, to close out here in the next, um, next month or so. Um, just an update in terms of the Florida appropriation request uh, that has been submitted to uh, Rep Andrade's office who will run that for us this year. Uh, just as we talked about at the December meeting, that is a 750,000 uh, request for FY 23, uh, 24, um, the uh, uh, Florida legislature is having their uh, committee weeks currently and session will kick off here at the first part of March. So we'll be engaged uh, throughout and certainly keep the, the board uh, apprised as, uh, as momentum uh, moves forward there and if there's any support uh, that's necessary from, from board members. Uh, just an update on the finance committee. We've been seeking out uh, two additional members and I'm hoping I've, I've got uh, Mayor Fitch and, and uh, Commissioner Wright on board to, to help us out and fill those slots so that way we can get that um, finance committee meeting quarterly again. Uh, again, more, more critical as we move forward into independent status. Um, so I'll be reaching out to, to the five members uh, there and getting that scheduled ahead of our next regularly scheduled uh, board meeting. Um, also want to uh, give a great thanks, and this won't be uh, uh, confirmed until uh, tomorrow, hopefully, but uh, to Santa Rosa County for, for coming in for their full $60,000 uh, contribution uh, to the program um, that uh, looked like it was uh, well received at the committee uh, meeting earlier this week, and then was also going to give a shout out to Santa Rosa County for those ind additional uh, investments uh, for um, enforcement on, on sedimentation in our systems. And then also to CMB County as well for, for coming up to that, to that full contribution of, of, of 60K to the program uh, by way of getting us uh, Grover's help. So uh, those additional hands and resources would be very, very critical for us moving forward. Um, and then just kind of alluded to based on Christine's presentation, and I've talked about this before, but there's I think we're just on a cusp of great transformational opportunities to, to hit our region, some that the board is aware that we can't yet share yet, but hopefully we'll, we'll be able to in, in the not too distant future. Um, and just having unprecedented funding opportunities to tackle you know, a lot of, of what was included in our CCMP. So we're looking forward to, to working with y'all. And then I just wanna give another shout out to, to our staff. We had a, a planning meeting uh, first part of January when we were all back in the office and spent uh, all day over in Orange Beach. So thanks to Orange Beach for letting us use your facility to plan out the year. And I got to tell you guys, there's a lot going on this year. <laughs> and it, you know, um, our, our team doesn't get, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the credit I think they often deserve. But, you know, we are a staff of, of six and they are doing you know, tremendous work uh, across the area from our education outreach team. Uh, to our, our science team and everybody in between. Uh, I know our, our staff works very closely with, with your respective teams and we look forward to, to carrying that out throughout the year. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Whitney, to give an update. I interject real quick, I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to leave and those dad burn doctors, they just won't forgive me. <laughs> And sorry, uh, with that, I would also just want to recognize uh, Councilman Baer. Uh, he's the alternate for the city of Pensacola who's, who's um, sitting here uh, observing, uh, uh, praying that Jared wasn't going to show. But, um, uh, but I appreciate you still being here and, and, and staying involved in the, in the estuary program. Thank you. I just wanted to briefly highlight some of the projects that we've uh, put in proposals for, and this first one has actually uh, been recently awarded. Um, the lead is the St. Andrew and St. Joseph Bay's estuary program, um, so we're partnering with them as, long, uh, as well as some Choctahatchee um, Bay estuary program, the Basin Alliance, and the Nature Conservancy. And we are going to look, uh, be looking at uh, the effectiveness of living shoreline projects 
um, across the Panhandle region. So this will be uh, our watersheds, the Choctahatchee uh, watershed, and also the St. Joe, St. Andrew watershed. So this was our opportunity to kind of look at all these different projects that have been funded over uh, different timeframes and looking at um, restoration effectiveness and also quantifying ecosystem uh, services of these projects. So we've selected some tentative sites um, for our watersheds and also, again, across the other two estuaries. And so this, um, we just got notification of this funding recently, and so this is through the Florida Centers of Excellence. Um, so this will be the next uh, three to four years, and we'll looking, uh, be looking at shoreline protection, uh, increased nutrient cycling, and habitat creation. So looking at parameters that kind of go under these categories, uh, and then really using this information to assist in setting meaningful restoration targets in the future, and to be able to provide this information uh, for future uh, funding as well. Um, and so just a brief overview, um, we gave some of this, uh, these updates at our uh, most recent Oyster Roundtable, um, but Santa Rosa County um, has a septic to sewer conversion um, proposal in uh, for NERDA money uh, for the next four years. Um, so the lead, again, is Santa Rosa County with uh, many partners, um, us included, as well as uh, Jay, Milton, and utility partners as well. So this is looking at 23 site locations. You can see on the map the little red indications um, and looking at prioritization based on um, several different factors. So this would include design, engineering, and construction for these projects, um, and an additional uh, master plan for um, 6,000 other conversions um, throughout East Milton. And so we would be assisting with some of the water quality monitoring and data collection and being able to track the success of these projects over time. Uh, another, uh, for the same um, funding source, for NERDA funding, we've put in a microbial source tracking proposal. Um, as you can see on the right-hand side, uh, there's a map of the nine sub-watersheds that um, are going to be focused on for this opportunity. Um, again, uh, our project partners, it's not just uh, us doing this. It'll be uh, in collaboration with the Scambia County, Santa Rosa County, ECUA, and the City of Pensacola. So this is a two-phased approach, uh, one to identify and address uh, bacterial impairments in our watersheds. Um, and using the DEP toolkit that has already been um, established for uh, assessing water bodies and impairments. And so we're mostly going to be uh, focusing on, um, of course, nine is not a, a trivial number. It's a lot of work. Um, but we've uh, worked with our partners to really identify the critical areas that we need this information for. Um, and this will also, this came up in conversation during our Oyster Roundtable since a lot of these areas in the Pensacola Bay system, um, especially related to the uh, oyster harvest. Um, so kind of getting to some of these root cause uh, information can help us um, be able to kind of target and then uh, also repair. Next slide. <laughs> Um, and then another big one, uh, these next two projects are both uh, NOAA infrastructure um, funding proposals. So this is uh, a big one led by us in partnership with the Nature Conservancy, Santa Rosa County, uh, FWC, and DEP. And so this is a, a big project kind of split into phases. So looking at um, all the information we've collected so far uh, through our oyster subcommittee and through the, uh, um, the finalization of the Oyster Fisheries Habitat and Management Plan. Um, we have had some uh, priorities already set uh, through the plan and our CCMP, looking at um, the first phase being the oyster restoration design and permitting throughout the Pensacola Bay system. Um, and then that would also um, fund the first phase of implementation as well as sediment load assessment. Um, like Christine had mentioned, there's um, definitely sedimentation issues throughout the Pensacola Bay system. So doing an assessment to kind of see where those priority areas are. And then also the sandy hollow um, gully restoration design and permitting. That's been a, a major source of concern in Santa Rosa County. And also, uh, it would fund uh, and implement a living shoreline cost share program. So it's a big one. Uh, we should probably find out in the next month or so um, if we've been successful with these um, funding opportunities. And then the next one um, is a pretty uh, watershed-wide initiative. Um, this is actually led by the Nature Conservancy, um, and partners are, of course, our program, City of Orange Beach, uh, Troy University, South Alabama, Mississippi State, 
um, the Dolphin Island Sea Lab, ADCNR, and Moffat and Nichols. So this is uh, a big effort um, looking at updating um, the living shoreline suitability model that has been done for the uh, western Alabama portion of Perdido. Um, through other funding, we've actually been able to work with uh, Chris Boyd from Troy to do a living shoreline suitability model. Um, we've worked with Santa Rosa County as well to do all of Pensacola Bay system and then uh, the portion of Perdido Bay system that hadn't been um, uh, completed. So this will be an update to that Alabama section uh, of the model. And then, of course, including education and outreach efforts uh, in this restoration planning and implementation. Um, so this would include planning and or implementation of the Orange Beach uh, Waterfront Park. You can see all these locations on the map on the right. Um, and then the Lower Perdido Island restoration projects um, that would, uh, some of these have already actually have planning in place. So this would be actually implementing the plans that have already been um, constructed. And then doing uh, Lillian Swamp and Bronson Field, those are big uh, living shoreline projects. And then also, again, uh, the Living Shoreline Cost Share Program. Um, so this will be in conjunction with the Living Shoreline Cost Share Program in the Pensacola Bay System. So this will be uh, watershed wide. And then another uh, exciting <laughs> announcement is that the State of the Bays, uh, we've been working really hard in the background to get um, uh, the web platform and all of the data ready to go for the State of the Bays report. Um, it is going very well. We think it looks really awesome. Um, these are kind of some of the um, graphics that we've been working with our designer, same designer uh, that developed the uh, CCMP with us. And so there'll be four main categories. Uh, we'll be looking at habitats, water quality, bacteria, and wildlife. And then under each um, indicator group, we'll kind of have a scale of ecosystem health. So you can see that below, either as improving, stable, declining, critical, or undetermined um, based on data sources. So we'll have some, uh, a lot of visuals for you to look at. Um, it'll be a great interactive platform. Um, we have a lot of maps, a lot of figures, um, and looking at different thresholds for these indicators. So it'll give you an overall kind of picture of the information we have so far and where we need to go from here. So uh, we're hoping to finish that up um, towards the end of the month into the next month um, and do a, an official reveal coming soon. So we're excited about that. <laughs> Pass it over to Logan. Thanks, Whitney. We're excited to give an update on the NOAA Bay Watershed Education Training Grant that we received last year. It has kicked into full gear and we are officially recruiting high school teachers across Baldwin, Santa Rosa, Escambia, and even Okaloosa County that are within our watershed. So please help spread the word. We've had a number of applications already come in for Escambia County, but we'd love to see our Baldwin County and Santa Rosa and Okaloosa partners have some additional submissions as well. And through this opportunity, these teachers will be provided an opportunity to come out with us for a whole week during the summer, June 5th through 9th. And they'll get to hear from oyster restoration specialists, farmers, go out and see oyster farms on the water, visit different restoration sites, talk with researchers about all of the current data and case studies that really are going to provide students in our watershed a great local context to explore these complex issues. And then there's funding available to implement that with their students the following year that covers the cost of their field trips, substitute teachers when they're out of the classroom, and supplies for their students. So there's a number of partners that are working with us on that one, and we're really excited to kick that off this summer. Thanks. And you may remember, we've been working in the background on producing an oyster docu documentary with Mississippi State TV Center, and it has been completed, and we are really excited to share that with everyone, and we have secured a date with WSRE to screen that at May, on May 18th at their Jean and Paul Amos studio, so please go ahead and save the date for that one. We'll be sending it as a calendar invite shortly as well, and that will be in the evening. We're still working on finalizing the exact time and it will have a panel discussion as well with some of our some of the folks featured in the film and some other experts as well. And then just an update on our Estuary 101 outreach campaign. Again, this is a multi-part campaign and it is officially going to launch the beginning of March, so stay tuned for that. 
has a couple different components, one being working with local social media influencers to really spread some key messaging, uh, launching an Estuary Explorers program that's encouraging our visitors and residents to go out and explore and immerse themselves in our estuary locations. And so we've been working with our different public property owners, some of you, uh, to establish some sites that we're going to encourage folks to go visit, and they'll get some swag from us when they complete a certain quantity of sites. We've also been developing a business and individual membership program, so that'll be launching about the same time. And we'll, as a part of this, have a pledge with specific actions that we're letting people know that they can take or implement in their lives, uh, whether they're an individual, a business, or organization to help improve our waters collectively. Next slide. And then I'm gonna pass it over to Maddie, and she's gonna give you an update on some of our community grant projects that have been underway. Hi, everybody. Is it too late to say Happy New Year's? <laughs> Haven't seen you guys since then. Okay, so we are gonna get started and talk about the community grant program. So we are about halfway through it. So we've been doing our mid-year meetings, catching up on everything that's being done with some of our community grants. And uh, we're also looking to try and get you guys out to see some of these firsthand instead of just hearing us talk about it to actually get to interact with some of these programs that we have this year. So we go to the next slide. I will start with talking about our Escambia County Coastal Landscaping Workshop and Plant Giveaway. So this is a really awesome, it's kind of a part two to what was done last year with their demonstration garden because they're using some of that to implement into this uh, landscaping workshop and plant giveaway. So there are some dates that I have up there for you guys to save the date for because the workshop sessions, they are gonna have two in the Perdido Key area and then one or two in the Pensacola Beach area. So the dates for those are Tuesday, February 28th at 6 p.m. and Friday, March 3rd at 11.30 a.m. for the Perdido Key ones, and those are gonna be at the community center. And then for the Pensacola one, it says Tuesday, March 7th at 6 p.m. and Friday, March 3rd at 11.30 a.m. at the Gulf Breeze Community Center. So it's, we're really excited about that, and then their plant giveaway is gonna be coming out in April. Next slide. Another project we have right now is the UWF Zooplankton Ecology and Water Quality Monitoring of the Perdido Bay. So this is really exciting. We just got to feature them in our newsletter. They're out there, they've found their sites, they're going out and they're sampling and monitoring. Um, and Haley actually got to join them just yesterday, so we're gonna have even more information on that one. So super excited about that project. Um, next one is gonna be our UWF stream bank erosion in the Pensacola Bay and Perdido Bay watersheds. And likewise, they are out there doing their field sampling right now. They're monitoring the erosion rates on our stream banks. And they're at a couple different sites. So like we have Perdido River, Hollinger Creek, Joe's Creek, Calpin Creek, and Bella Fontaine, I think I'm saying that right, <laughs> Creek. But those were really interesting to see all that. And we're hoping to get a field day of at least one of the staff members out there to get it firsthand to bring back for our um, newsletter and our content on social media. Next one. So our Blackwater Soil and Water Conservation District No-Till Seed Drill Rental Program is getting underway. They've officially gotten their drill, so we're super excited about that. And soon will be, right now they're drafting up their rental agreements and they're hoping to have a ceremony, like a release ceremony for that rental program. And as soon as I get those dates, those will be shared with you. So we're super excited about this project. Um, and then, not next, actually go back, sorry. Just another update that doesn't have a slide. So another project that we have is the Northwest Florida State College Peripheral Oyster Mapping in Santa Rosa Sound and Urban Bayous of Pensacola Bay. So we do have a field day planned for one of our staff later this February. And again, we're just trying to see if we can get any dates for you guys to go out and see some of this sampling in the water, out on the boats and stuff like that. So stay tuned. Hey, on, the, on this that is up though, um, that was one of the uh, things that we awarded for, uh, for the mini grant this year, right? Which one? The no-till. Yeah, those were all for our community yep. grant. And, um, and if I remember correctly, it was going to be no cost to the farmers to use this? Is that... Uh, or, or small cost? No, it's a rental program, so it's a lower cost. They're actually drafting that up right now. We do have... 
Nazy here if she would like to put any input it, into it. Commissioner, it's it's just the the co um, cost of maintenance, so it's I think ten or fifteen dollars. So year, very, right, very minimal cost then. Yeah. Right, very minimal. Which yes. which yeah. all I was yeah. doing was highlighting that it's a yeah. very minimal cost for them to come come use this, and so I think that's a I still think that's a great thing, and I um, I know Santa Rosa County was was really excited about that uh, before, so just want to highlight that. Thanks. Well, and I, and I think that the time saving and not having to go till first and then go back and, and seed would more than pay for, for it in the time savings. Yeah, so again, really exciting projects came out of our community grant and they're not even done yet, but we're super excited to see how they do all wrap up. Um, and those are just a couple updates for that. And now we can move to the next slide. And I'm going to talk a little about our trash free water curriculum. So I have been out in the schools for the past month and a half, um, really getting this trash free waters curriculum out there. So we've already hit um, Workman Middle School, Coastline Christian Academy and Gulf Breeze High School. So in total, we're already at over 400 students engaged just by doing those three different schools. Um, and we're very excited because we've hit not only a middle school, uh, but we've also done an elementary and a high school. So we've already knocked those out for this first part. Um, and we've, we actually introduced a case study with Gulf Breeze High School. They just started it Monday and Tuesday. We just took the classrooms out. So they're doing a campus case study where they actually go and collect data on their campus about the trash that they find there. And then they're gonna present uh, the solutions that they think could keep that trash from constantly being on their campus. So we're really excited to see how that goes through. Um, and then by the end of February, we will also be in the Creative Learning Academy, West Florida High School, and down at the Navarre Beach Marine Science Station to add some more um, Trash Free Waters curriculum outreach doing that, which again, hits at least our elementary school and our high schools on that one. So super excited. I'm looking at almost doubling the amount that we've already seen with the Trash Free Waters curriculum. So we're making some progress there. And we'll have a second case study using uh, West Florida High School. So we'll actually be able to see it from two totally different locations and two different counties. Okay, and next slide. So our outreach events. We've been out, like Matt said, we were been very busy and it's only a month and a half in. So we had a Pea Ridge Elementary Science Night that Logan and I went to, and it was a really great experience to go to a school that we really haven't interacted that much with. And they're more in the not super upper part of our watershed, but upper part of where we typically have all the schools that get a hold of us for this. Um, so it was really interesting because we got to bring out local critters. We went and did a seine net day um, and caught some critters from the Archie Glover boat ramp up in Milton. And then we got to bring them to the school, set up the tank, and everybody was super excited about it. They were very, very engaged in what we had going on there. Lots of questions, lots of kids with their own little fun facts. Um, and I just thought it was really interesting because um, they, a lot of not just the kids, but the parents as well, weren't quite clear on where Escambia Bay was. So it's, it's just, uh, it really shows that importance of how these outreach events work for us. You know, we get to go out there and we get to show people, this is really your backyard, this is where it's at, and this is what lives in it. So it's a really, really great opportunity with that. Um, next slide. Now we're moving into our volunteer events. So last year we started our Mardi Gras bead tree cleanup and it was right down Palafox Street and it was actually really successful for it being our first time. We had a great turnout and collected a lot of beads. We take these beads, um, so everybody knows about the downtown Mardi Gras parade. Um, there are contracted services to clean the streets and the sidewalks, but those contracted services don't actually touch the trees. So we've decided to get some volunteers together to clean those beads out of the trees because, as you all know, we get hurricane seasons, a lot of wind, a lot of water, and those beads will get knocked down and get into our storm drains and eventually get into our waters. So we just like to host a day right after the parade to go down Palafox Street and clean as many beads out of the trees as we can. We then take these beads to Art Gateway, which is a bead recycling center and they clean and repackage all the beads for future use in other parades. So we're super excited about that. Save the date if you guys want to come out. It is that Sunday right after it, so February 19th, and it's going to be from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. And not that this should be your only reason to show up, but we will also have prizes. 
And I think we can go to the next slide and I'm gonna hand it back over to Logan. We're also very excited as we've been transitioning from completing the CCMP and having a little more time to implement and grow our outreach program to expand our volunteer programs. And so we have two different programs that we're starting in March that we have trainings coming up for. And these are in our volunteer newsletters. They'll be on our website calendar shortly if you'd like to share them with folks. The first one is a Bay Ambassadors training. So we're looking for folks who enjoy talking to people or are passionate about their local waters and are gonna help us have even more of a presence at local festivals, events, community presentations. So they'll get trained up on our mission, what we do, some of our projects, and as well as the State of the Bays once that is released so that they will be able to go and share that information with the community. And then we have volunteers we're calling critter catchers or critter collectors that are gonna go out and help us sane for our observation tank like you saw that Maddie featured. So they'll have a chance to either get their feet wet or get in waders if it's too cold or if they just don't wanna get wet that day and help us gather some of those species that they'll then help us run in our observation tank at events or at different field trips and school events. So those dates will be coming soon, but essentially almost every Saturday in March, we have trainings for those coming up. And a couple, um, an evening option for the Bay Ambassadors one as well. And Molly is gonna give you an update on the Resilience Survey Project. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Molly McDaniel. I know we've got some new faces and I may not have been able to introduce myself yet, but I wanted to provide a brief update on the Resilience Readiness Survey that I've been working on since I was brought on last summer as an intern. So just broad overview, this uh, project is a partnership between um, PPVP, the University of West Florida, PLACE SLR, which is the program for a local adaptation to climate effects with a focus on sea level rise, as well as our local extension agents in the city of Pensacola. So with this, uh, this project and this survey, the goal was really to enhance resilience planning efforts in the city of Pensacola and then use the data from the survey to develop some small scale demonstration or pilot project that's really led by the community's concerns. And so the survey was brief, only about 10 minutes. It was online for folks to take. And the survey period was last August, and we wrapped it up at the end of the year. So in the past month or so and over the next few months, we're going to be working on analyzing the results and working with our partners to really identify the concerns that stand out based on the four sections of the survey and the questions that were asked. So asking folks about their perceptions of if and how climate change and those impacts and effects affect them, as well as community needs and their overall perceptions on both their personal preparedness and the uh, preparedness of their community to withstand um, severe weather impacts and those climate effects. And as I said, the survey is wrapped up and we're working on developing that pilot project in the future that could range from a small scale education um, initiative or maybe a small uh, green infrastructure demonstration. That's all I have. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So again, not much going on. <laughs> But certainly, if, if there's any questions for our team, we're happy to answer them. If not, then we will move to the committee updates. Um, so we didn't, we haven't had a technical committee yet. Um, that'll be at the end of the month. Um, so we're not going to have an update from the technical folks. But um, for the Oyster Subcommittee, we just hosted um, an Oyster Roundtable meeting at the Santa Rosa County Extension Office. Um, we had a great showing. Uh, we have more than 60 participants in the workshop. Um, it was a great uh, show of all different um, folks from the community. And we had um, a series of partners that provided updates on projects, um, specifically infrastructure projects, septic to sewer conversions, um, and different monitoring, and, as well as watershed assessment. So we had people from um, FDAX, DEP, FWC, the Department of Health, um, and some of our utilities. So we had Pace Water, ECUA, City of Milton, um, discussing some of the ongoing projects just to kind of get everybody on the same page about what we already have going on 
and what are the major concerns of uh, community members. So we had kind of a, the presentations with a quite robust question and answer period. And then um, at, after lunch, we hosted um, a discussion. And so that was kind of focused around solutions. Um, so we know what the problems are. Let's really put our minds together and figure out what the best moving, um, moving forward would be. So that kind of revolved around septic to sewer conversions, um, stormwater runoff management, uh, land development codes um, and enf enforcement, um, tracking sources of bacterial impairments, and then uh, properly communicating oyster closure and safe harvest uh, of oysters. So it was really great to have everybody in the room. Um, we had no lack of discussion. Everybody um, you know, had a lot of great input uh, at this meeting, and I think that we can really take this moving forward, um, developing that you know, to, to kind of take those next steps in, in figuring out the best way forward keeping the conversations going with our partners um, to make these things happen, um, and really gathering uh, all the information we have um, at this point to further inform uh, future proposals um, to get these things done. So um, we really look forward to uh, our next engagement. Um, hopefully we'll have further updates uh, at the next Oyster uh, Subcommittee meeting in March. Um, and so we'll be working in the background to synthesize all this feedback um, and kind of develop a path forward. Just one, uh, well, two notes on that. First, I just want to thank uh, uh, Vernon and uh, Commissioner Kohler for being there. That was great to, to have board representation. I know there were more board members wanted to be there, but already had scheduling conflicts. Uh, you know, with the 60 plus in attendance, it was a great turnout. But <clears throat> one of the things that uh, our aquaculture operator partners mentioned. Uh, is kind of this issue that we see in messaging. So, you know, we've talked uh, the last few meetings back to early part of last year about uh, the Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services expanding that shellfish harvesting closure uh, in the Pensacola Bay system. So that does include uh, East Bay and, and Escambia Bay uh, due, con due to consistent uh, exceedances for the bacteria considerations. That does not uh, mean that um, you know, the oysters that are coming out of, of Pensacola Bay uh, are, are contaminated or not suitable for consumption. Uh, our aquaculture operators in the, in the Bay system work very hard and have to um, uh, meet very rigid uh, requirements from DAX and able to, uh, to be able to bring those um, uh, oysters uh, to market. And so just one thing that, that we're trying to work on as a team and that I'd ask you as, as board members is when, you, when you're out there talking to the community about the issues that we do have in Pensacola Bay, just remember that the oysters that are coming out uh, are meeting standard and they are uh, you know, safe to eat. Um, we, don't, we don't want to have unintended consequences of shutting down uh, the few uh, aquaculture operators that we do have, what we need to focus on is being able to address those upstream water quality issues. So that was an interesting point that came out of that discussion that we ne didn't necessarily think about, uh, but we want to work to them on uh, work with them on on expanding that messaging. No slide for this one for the education and outreach committee meeting. Um, Carrie was online, but she had to hop off for an appointment, so I'm going to give the update for the committee today. Since we are having our elections next week, we don't have a new chair to cover this yet. So we met back in December for our annual wrap-up meeting, and we we're excited to see some new faces at that meeting uh, to get them involved. So our next meeting, um, next Thursday, the 16th, is actually going to be a hybrid meeting, because we do see a kind of mix of local versus online participants who can attend. Uh, so we're hoping that we can bring all of those folks together Together and have a, a greater turnout by doing a hybrid meeting for them. And one of the things we're going to be asking them at that meeting to help us with is to take a look at some of our Estuary 101 campaign content before it goes live and to just give it a final look on some of that messaging. So we're excited to get their feedback on that. And then just the note on the environmental justice, what should say committee, this is my second time putting that wrong in the agenda, uh, un unless Molly has anything to add. Uh, the next meeting will be on March 14th at uh, 6 o'clock. Um, and that, that committee will start uh, working towards development of an environmental justice strategy for our area. And just on a related note, wanted to point out that the EPA Gulf of Mexico Division just put out a funding opportunity this week uh, um, focused on environmental justice. So. Uh, we can certainly pass that along to, to the board members um, and get that out to the community that, that would need it most. Uh, 
those opportunities can focus on uh, you know, flood mitigation and reduction, water quality improvement, uh, habitat restoration, um, really any, any, anything as, as it relates to uh, that water quality, habitat, community resilience element that is in um, an environmental justice um, uh, need area. Okay, perfect. Thank you, everybody, for the updates. Uh, any policy board or agency updates? Policy board members, any updates? Any agency updates? Okay. Any public comment? Good afternoon. My name is Jerry Cooey, and uh, I'll, I'll wear the Santa Rosa County citizen-led watershed protection committee hat today thank you all matt his staff you guys I, I know you're you're all busy folks but thank you i appreciate it as a as a person who was fortunate enough to live up uh, grow up on yellow river um, uh, these things are important i sadly i have watched um, I, I i shared with some folks at the oyster meeting that I, re I remember one fishing trip in particular in 1971 going upriver in Yellow River where there was so many mullet in Yellow River that we, they couldn't get away from the boat. We left a string of mullet behind us. And sadly, year after year after year, fin fish across the board have gotten less and less and less. Um, specifically, thank you. I, I, I'm all about the science, too, and, and it's good we're... we're, we're we're marking that we're, we're coming with a good with a good argument I want to encourage you to also discuss enforcement we have very good laws on the books today for example it's an illicit discharge to pump out a stormwater pond yet I had a lady that called me and one near her was pumped out four times. And in the process, she lost the hay in her barn. It was an illicit discharge. It was put on somebody else's private property. That person's still doing whatever they want to do. Um, uh, Col Colton knows we, we, we talk about it a lot. I, look, I'm glad we've, uh, that we're going to hire f four additional people to watch. But one of, the, one of my comments to the commission was, we already know it's happening. Let's enforce it. Uh, sadly, the counties are, are currently held at about $350 a day fine. That's nothing. And, and, and let me say this, I'm, I'm not an anti-development person. 97% of our population doesn't need a single law on the books because they do the right thing. I'm here talking about the 3% that over and over and over, they pump the holding pond when they know it's against the law. We had one, uh, uh, Colton is aware of it. We've been fighting a Air Oak subdivision in East Milton, very near Blackwater. Allowed sediment to get in their holding pond. It was there. They caused it, flooded their holding pond, and they put red clay in the Blackwater River repeatedly. Um, uh, the runoff there is so bad that the county actually had to go clean the, clean the ditch out that's downstream of that. Um, I just ask that you, you, you focus on, and, and, and I appreciate Matt using the word partners. We have a lot of partners out there, you know, the DEP and the EPA and local law enforcement and all those kind of things. Uh, I'm proud to say that Santa Rosa County has set up an illicit discharge link on their page, and we're promoting that across social media because I, I'll tell you, and I'll tell you why it's important to import, report it immediately is those two incidents that I told you about, there was somebody hiding in the woods after dark that was actually turning the pump on. They turned the pump on. They were knowingly and willingly violating state and federal law. Um, that's the kind of stuff. And, and, and sadly, my plea to you is let's set an example. Let's make the front page of the Pensacola News Journal where somebody has knowingly and willingly discharged into our waters, added sediment to our water. Um, all of this is good work, but we're going to have to set the tone. So just please keep that in your mind when you talk to your 
You mentioned you're going to go see Mr. Hamilton. Feel free to sh share with him. Uh, th this is becoming frustrating with me. We, we uh, you know, to learn that a county can only find $350 a day is ridiculous. So let's work on that side of it too. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Curry. Anyone else for public comment? Anything else for the good of the whole? Uh, yes, sir. I just wanted to say, you know, obviously being careful, recognizing I was the last one in today. Don't want to hold us up and keep us late, but I did be in my first meeting, want to uh, acknowledge Matt and team and thank them for the onboarding process. Uh, the way this is all laid out is certainly streamlines coming on for a first meeting and where we're at and where we're headed makes it very easy to feel like, hey, we're ready to, to jump in and contribute. And uh, certainly grateful to join all of you uh, and get to work alongside you. So looking forward to, to being on this board with you. And uh, sorry, Mr. Bear, I don't intend to miss, but I am glad to see you here. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, anyway, thank you. All right. Thank you. Anything else? Thank you for getting on right away and putting on that, that, that on your agenda so you're already about to approve it. We will get that to all of you. Again, we need your help uh, getting that on for your, because I think if we had nine jurisdictions with us, it'd be a lot easier for us to go and say, yes, here, here's what they're already telling us. So uh, we'll get that to all of y'all. If you just get that on your calendars, we appreciate it. All right. Thank you. Anything else? Stand adjourned. Very good. You've been doing burning. I've seen you a couple of times. Running. Uh